the press tonight. Now it's time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel, and I'll be joining you at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, our leadoff batter tonight is Harvard Law School Professor Lawrence Tribe. We're nice. going to get his reaction to that Supreme Court decision today, followed by Andrew Weissman and the new guilty plea from Trump world today, uh, Alan Weisselberg pleading guilty for perjury. But later in the hour, there's this very important turn we've seen in the Biden administration uh, toward uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu's government with, with Vice President Kamala Harris publicly anyway, leading the way in what is a break uh, with the Netanyahu government's policy, Vice President Harris yesterday unequivocally calling for a ceasefire yeah. in Gaza. Seems like a very important turn in the way uh, the administration's handling this. Yeah, and to me, the thing that's, I mean, there's all sorts of interesting politics in, around it, but to me, it's signaled that I, I don't think the, the White House would be doing that. I don't think Vice President Harris would be doing that if that was something that was impossible. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's sort of what my heart leapt to when I heard her say it, that if she's saying that, it must mean they think it can happen. If they think it can happen, you know, God hopes it will. We're just going to roll the tape later of what the vice president had to say. Uh, and she had, she had a lot to say about it. We're going to see that later in the hour. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Thanks. Thank you. Well, yesterday's Republican primary had what has become the standard vote split of 63% to 33%. But this time, Nikki Haley got the 63% and Donald Trump got the 33%. It was in the smallest Republican primary so far. It was in Washington, D.C., where in a city of 700,000 people, exactly 676 of them voted for Donald Trump. The reason that tiny vote is significant is that Donald Trump's jury pool for Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's case against Donald Trump for alleged crimes leading up to and on January 6th will be taken, that jury pool will be taken from those 700,000 people who spent yesterday not voting for Donald Trump. The odds of one of the 676 Republicans who did vote for Donald Trump in Washington, D.C. yesterday ending up on his jury there are worse than your odds with any lottery ticket you could buy anywhere. The most important Washington, D.C. voters for Donald Trump, though, are, of course, the nine voters on the United States Supreme Court. And today, all nine of them agreed that Donald Trump, who three of the justices called an oath-breaking insurrectionist, cannot be barred from presidential ballots by individual states on the basis of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, as most of you know by now, bars anyone who took an oath of office and then engaged in insurrection from ever holding office again. Donald Trump's lawyers lost on several arguments that they presented to the court. They argued that the presidency is not an office, the Supreme Court ignored that argument. The Trump lawyers argued that the president is not an officer of the government. The Supreme Court ignored that argument. And most importantly, the Trump lawyers argued that Donald Trump did not engage in insurrection and that the attack on the Capitol was not an insurrection. The Supreme Court ignored that argument and left standing the finding by the Colorado Supreme Court that Donald Trump did indeed engage in insurrection. The Supreme Court's opinion simply said that the individual states are not allowed to enforce the provisions of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against candidates for federal office. The opinion said that the state of Colorado could enforce Section 3 of the 14th Amendment against candidates seeking state and local offices in Colorado. The five Republican men on the Supreme Court, two of whom were appointed by Donald Trump, extended their majority opinion far beyond what the nine justices were willing to agree on in the essential ruling by indicating that even the federal enforcement of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment would require the Congress to pass implementing legislation. The three justices of the Supreme Court appointed by President Obama and President Biden wrote a separate opinion 
of only six pages, where they referred to Donald Trump as an oath-breaking insurrectionist four times and said, quote, legislation of any kind, however, is not required. And that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is self-executing, meaning that it does not depend on implementing legislation. The three concurring justices, Sonia Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Ketanji Brown-Jackson, said, quote, Section 3 provides that when an oath-breaking insurrectionist is disqualified, Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. It is hard to understand why the Constitution would require a congressional supermajority to remove a disqualification if a simple majority could nullify sections three, Section 3's operation by repealing or declining to pass implementing legislation. It's worse than they know. It would not take a simple majority to decline to pass implementing legislation, to vote against implementing legislation. It would only take 41 out of 100 senators to block implementing legislation, which according to the procedural rules of the United States Senate, requires a 60-vote majority threshold to pass. So, if a group of 59 senators agreed on implementing legislation tomorrow for Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, it could not become law. It could be blocked by 41 senators who support an oath-breaking insurrection and want to see insurrectionist and want to see an oath-breaking insurrectionist become president again. There are now 49 Republican senators, and only one of them, the retiring Mitt Romney, has said he is opposed to the oath-breaking insurrectionist Donald Trump becoming president again. That leaves 48 Republican senators who would refuse to ever approve any implementing legislation for Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The last judge appointed to the court by Donald Trump, Amy Coney Barrett, wrote her own one-paragraph concurring opinion saying simply, I agree that states lack the power to enforce Section 3 against presidential candidates. That principle is sufficient to resolve this case, and I would decide no more than that. Justice Barrett then added a second paragraph to her one-page concurrence that did not have a single word of jurisprudence in it. It was a political speech aimed at the three other justices who agreed with her that majority, the majority of five on the Supreme Court went too far in their opinion. Justice Barrett, though she apparently agrees with those three justices, decided for political purposes that their language was too harsh. And that is a political choice, not a jurisprudential choice. In a political statement, unlike any that I've ever seen in a Supreme Court opinion, Justice Barrett wrote, in my judgment, this is not the time to amplify disagreement with stridency. In her view, no doubt, stridency means using phrases like an oath-breaking insurrectionist to describe Donald Trump. Justice Barrett continued, the court has settled a politically charged issue in the volatile season of a presidential election, particularly in this circumstances. Writings on the court should turn the national temperature down, not up. For present purposes, our differences are far less important than our unanimity. All nine justices agree on the outcome of this case. That is the message Americans should take home. Written not like a Supreme Court justice, but like a political speechwriter. The message Americans should take home. Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and Justice Jackson highlighted the wild inconsistency of the Roberts Court by quoting Chief Justice Roberts himself, who wrote this when he joined the majority opinion in overturning Roe versus Wade, quote, if it is not necessary to decide more to dispose of a case, then it is necessary not to decide more. The three justices then said, 
That fundamental principle of judicial restraint is practically as old as our republic, yet the court continues on to resolve questions not before us. In a sensitive case, crying out for judicial restraint, it abandons that course. Today, the majority goes beyond the necessities of this case to limit how Section 3 can bar an oath-breaking insurrectionist from becoming president. Although we agree that Colorado cannot enforce Section 3, we protest the majority's effort to use this case to define the limits of federal enforcement of that provision because we would decide only the issue before us. We concur only in the judgment. And today, at the Florida Club, where Donald Trump cannot afford to live without charging other people money to use his home, the oath-breaking insurrectionist thanked the Supreme Court for their opinion and then spent most of his time asking the court for another favor, to grant him total immunity for any form of criminal prosecution for crimes that he may have committed while he was president. In fact, most of his statement was begging for that criminal immunity. He did say this about today's opinion. Frankly, they worked very quickly on something that will be spoken about 100 years from now and 200 years from now, extremely important. Well, he's absolutely right about that. It will be spoken of in history classrooms 100 years from now and 200 years from now, where he will, if the country remains lucky for the next couple of centuries, be identified as the only former president in history who was once blocked from presidential ballots by states invoking Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. And those history classes will all note that the Supreme Court opinion that allowed him access to the ballot repeatedly referred to him as an oath-breaking insurrectionist. Leading off our discussion tonight is Professor Lawrence Tribe, who has taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School for five decades. Professor Tribe, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I, I have to confess, this one required me to read and reread it, especially the concurrences which read like dissents. I, I had to remind myself, oh, no, they're agreeing with the ultimate vote here. Um, but I, I, can, you, can you clarify for us what the contest is here between the four uh, and then the five in the majority and referee for us who's right here? Well, I'll do my best, Lawrence. In this case, the court, in the court appears to the naked eye to be deciding something nine to nothing. But when you peel back the appearances, it's really a five to four decision about a fundamental principle, a principle about the viability of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, a crucial protection for the country against oath-breaking insurrectionists. The decisive fifth vote in this five to four split, I hasten to add, was the same as the decisive fifth vote in Bush versus Gore. It was Clarence Thomas, who some people believe had no business taking part in the case. But let me set that aside. The key question is, what's the big difference between what all nine justices agree, namely, Colorado alone should not be able to make this decision. And what only five justices believed, and that is that unless you have implementing legislation by Congress, the ban in the 14th Amendment against office holding by oath-breaking insurrectionists, that ban is going to be effective. The Constitution explicitly says that you need two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate to lift the ban and enable an oath-breaking insurrectionist to hold office. But the five-justice majority in this case said, oh, no, we're going to rewrite that for various reasons. We're going to rewrite it to say, that 
unless you have legislation that requires, as you point out, not just a majority of the Senate, but given the filibuster rule, requires a supermajority of the Senate plus a majority of the House. Unless you have that legislation, you can't enforce this provision so that an oath-breaking insurrectionist can hold office as long as minorities of the Congress are on that insurrectionist side. That turns the 14th Amendment upside down. It rewrites it without any defense in the text or the history or the purposes of the 14th Amendment. Now, what was the problem that led these five justices to turn the 14th Amendment upside down that way? Well, it was something that appealed to all nine justices, the idea that Colorado alone or any other individual state should not be able to make this decision on its own. But when that was brought up in the oral argument, the lawyer for the voters who challenged Donald Trump said, oh, no, we're not saying that Colorado should have the last word. We're saying that you, the Supreme Court, a federal institution, should have the last word, and you should exercise it by reviewing the decision of the Colorado Supreme Court, a carefully reasoned, elaborate explanation of why what happened in this case was an insurrection and why Donald Trump engaged in it, based on a trial whose fairness not a single one of the nine justices questioned, in which Donald Trump had ample opportunity to present evidence. So all the Supreme Court needed to do to avoid allowing any one state to, have, to impose a rule on the nation or to avoid what it thought would be chaos of 50 different states going 50 different ways was to remember something that this court normally emphasizes. It is the Supreme Court of the United States. All it had to do was affirm the decision of the Colorado court, saying there's ample evidence here in a trial that was fully fair, that applied constitutionally appropriate standards, ample evidence to disqualify this oath-breaking insurrectionist. End of case. In other words, they could have gone in either of two directions. And there's only one possible reason for going in the direction they did. And that was they were doing a favor to oath-breaking insurrectionists, in particular, one Donald J. Trump. Now, that is not the way a court should behave. And it, yes, 100 years from now, that's still going to be an object lesson mm -hmm. in how courts should not decide cases and in how a court by a 5-4 decision can fundamentally destroy the Constitution's deliberate protection against office holding by oath-breaking insurrectionists. I, I can only imagine uh, Harvard Law School students' eyes widening 100 years from now and 200 years from now when they read this case. Professor Lawrence Tribe, thank you very much for starting off our discussions tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. And coming up, Donald Trump's long-suffering and fully humiliated accountant, Alan Weisselberg, pleaded guilty today to perjury in a case brought by District Attorney Alvin Bragg, who will begin the first criminal prosecution of Donald Trump in Manhattan three weeks from today. And Donald Trump told a judge in New York that he just cannot afford to pay the $91 million judgment that he owes to E. Jean Carroll. That's next with Andrew Weissman. Donald Trump's long-suffering and fully humil humiliated criminal accountant is going back to jail, 76-year-old Alan Weisselberg, who prefers the fancy title chief financial officer of the Trump family businesses, pleaded guilty today to perjury. Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg obtained the guilty plea from Weisselberg, who was forced to appear in court today in handcuffs. Weisselberg admitted to lying under oath 
to the New York State Attorney General's office when they were investigating Donald Trump for business fraud. A judge has imposed a penalty of $454 million against Donald Trump in that case of business fraud. Weisselberg will be sentenced for perjury on April 10th. Alan Weisselberg already served time at New York City's Rikers Island Jail for tax fraud for a Trump company scheme that paid Alan Weisselberg in ways that Donald Trump and Alan Weisselberg hoped would escape taxation like giving Alan Weisselberg a luxury apartment and a Mercedes-Benz and other benefits. The perjury prosecution of Alan Weisselberg comes as a warning to any other Trump-friendly witnesses who could be testifying in the first criminal prosecution of Donald Trump, led by Alvin Bragg's office, which will begin in Manhattan on March 25th, exactly three weeks from today. In that case, Donald Trump is criminally charged with keeping false business records to illegally conceal hush money payments to porn star Stormy Daniels to purchase her secrecy prior to the 2016 presidential election in a conspiracy to prevent voters from hearing Stormy Daniels' story of the night she spent having sex with Donald Trump while Donald Trump's third wife was pregnant. And Donald Trump continues to struggle under the over half a billion dollars in civil judgments against him in New York, including $83.3 million judgment awarded to E. Jean Carroll plus interest. Uh, e. Jean Carroll, who was raped by Donald Trump, according to the verdict rendered by the jury in that civil case. In the Trump lawyer's filing, they asked the judge in the E. Jean Carroll case, Lewis Kaplan, for, quote, an unsecured stay of execution, end quote of the judgment. Knowing how unlikely that is, the lawyers went on to say, even if the court does not grant an unsecured stay, it should at the very least grant a partially secured stay in an amount substantially reduced from the $91.63 million otherwise required. The amount of bond Donald Trump's lawyers suggested instead of $91 million, was 24 million. Joining us now is Andrew Weissman, former FBI general counsel and former chief of the criminal division in the Eastern District of New York and co-author of the new book, The Trump Indictments, the historic charging documents with commentary. Uh, Andrew, I want to begin with the Weisselberg guilty plea. That was the breaking news of the day. Uh, there were indications it might be coming, but here it is. Lawrence, listening to your description right now, you're sitting there thinking, wait a second, this person is running for president and actually is going to get the nomination from a leading party. It's unbelievable. So let's just turn to Alan Weisselberg. Alan Weisselberg is lashed completely to Donald Trump. He was the long-term CFO, chief financial officer of the Trump Organization. He pleaded guilty to a tax fraud scheme of over a dozen years. The Trump Organization itself was convicted at trial just last year in the Manhattan DA's office. Um, then he is pleading now to a two actual perjury counts to lying in the civil fraud case where Donald Trump and, by the way, Alan Weisselberg were found civilly liable for fraud. But in addition, you have that Alan Weisselberg, in addition to being a defendant there and being found liable, also now is a defendant for lying in the attorney general's civil case. Um, I mean, this is sort of really just an array of crime. And during this whole period, everything that I've talked to you about in terms of the criminal actions um, that he pled to, his current actions, he has been paid by the Trump Organization millions of dollars. At no point did they cut him off saying, oh, wait, we can't have a criminal on our books. We can't be paying somebody like this. Nope, he has been paid millions of dollars by the Trump Organization. And that is an example of hush money, not just the money that went to Stormy Daniels. That was money for him to be towing the line and not flip on Donald Trump and the Trump Organization. Andrew, as every lawyer and every litigant is supposed to know, there are many reasons to be nice to your judge including the fact that someday you might be asking something from that judge that it was that might be within that judge's jurisdiction like hey instead of the 91 million can i give you 24 million and donald trump is asking that of a judge who he insulted every opportunity he got so judge kaplan is a is a an adult he, it wouldn't the assault the insult itself wouldn't 
make a difference. I mean, they can't help. Um, but that, you know, he's good enough that he, if he thought it was meritorious, he would look past that. But here you have somebody who has not been forthcoming about his financial records. He's given no reason to think that he wouldn't stiff E. Jean Carroll. Um, he's continued to defame her. I, I think that this is, the odds of this being granted are somewhere between slim and none. Mm -hmm. Andrew Weissman, thank you very much for joining us once again tonight. Always appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. And coming up, Vice President Kamala Harris is now leading what has become the Biden administration's now very public demand for a ceasefire in Gaza. That's next. Vice President Kamala Harris has several times traveled to Selma, Alabama for the annual commemoration of what is remembered as Bloody Sunday, Sunday the day in 1965 when civil rights protesters, including young John Lewis, were savagely beaten by police officers in a march that was asking for nothing more than the full rights of citizenship granted to us all by the Constitution. The vice president was in Selma yesterday, 59 years after that bloody Sunday, and she began her speech with a surprise heard around the world. Before I begin today, I must address the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. What we are seeing every day in Gaza is devastating. We have seen reports of families eating leaves or animal feed, women giving birth to malnourished babies with little or no medical care, and children dying from malnutrition and dehydration. As I have said many times, too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. And just a few days ago, we saw hungry, desperate people approach aid trucks, simply trying to secure food for their families after weeks of nearly no aid reaching northern Gaza. And they were met with gunfire and chaos. Our hearts break for the victims of that horrific tragedy and for all the innocent people in Gaza who are suffering from what is clearly a humanitarian catastrophe. People in Gaza are starving. The conditions are inhumane. And our common humanity compels us to act. Our common humanity is always the issue in the commemoration in Selma every year. Our common humanity was shocked in this country 59 years ago when TV news showed the violence done willfully by the government of Alabama to people marching for their rights. Yesterday, the Department of Defense carried out its first airdrop of humanitarian assistance, and the United States will continue these airdrops. And we will work on a new route by sea to deliver aid. And the Israeli government must do more to significantly increase the flow of aid. No excuses. They must open new border crossings. They must not impose any unnecessary restrictions on the delivery of aid. And there, the Vice President of the United States became the public strongest voice of the Biden-Harris administration's now strained relationship with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The Vice President insisted that Israel had a right to retaliate against Hamas. Hamas has shown no regard for innocent life, including for the people of Gaza, who have suffered under its rule for almost two decades. And Hamas still holds dozens of hostages for nearly 150 days now. Innocent men and women, including American citizens, who were brutally taken from their homes and from a concert. 
And then the vice president voiced the Biden-Harris administration's most significant public break with the policies of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. This would allow us to build something more enduring, to ensure Israel is secure, and to respect the right of the Palestinian people to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. Hamas claims it wants a ceasefire. Well, there is a deal on the table. And as we have said, Hamas needs to agree to that deal. Let's get a ceasefire. Let's reunite the hostages with their families. And let's provide immediate relief to the people of Gaza. And today at the White House, the Biden-Harris administration, in a move followed closely by every Israeli, went around Prime Minister Netanyahu to meet with a member of the Israel War Cabinet, Benny Gantz, who is the leader of the opposing party to Netanyahu in Israel. That is an unprecedented White House meeting during a crisis in Israel. And Benjamin Netanyahu did not want that meeting to happen. The New York Times reports that Netanyahu, quote, had not approved Mr. Gantz's travel to Washington. An official in Mr. Netanyahu's office who spoke on the condition of anonymity said Mr. Gantz did not represent the government on his trip to Washington and insisted the prime minister continued to enjoy open communication with President Biden. Joining us now is David Rothkopf, foreign affairs analyst and columnist for The Daily Beast. He is also the host of the Deep State Radio podcast. David, uh, it seems like a pretty important turn, public turn, by the White House on something we have every reason to believe was happening privately, which was the insistence on a ceasefire. Here's the vice president saying publicly, it has to happen. Yeah, it, it, her emphasis, her tone is quite different from that which we've heard before from other senior officials. I think she has been leading the way behind the scenes and now at the microphone for the administration to emphasize how important it is uh, to address the humanitarian catastrophe that's unfolding there. I don't think there is daylight between her and the president on this, but I do think she's playing a a remarkable role, really, at the center of this. It began in December when she gave an important speech in, in Dubai and talked about the day after in Gaza. It included this meeting in Selma. And, of course, she is the one who met with Gantz today uh, in Washington. So she's at the center of this, uh, which is, you know, right now uh, one of the two most important foreign policy challenges the administration faces. What do Israelis hear in the vice president's speech yesterday? And possibly more importantly, what do Israelis see uh, in their media when they see uh, the vice president uh, meeting with Benny Gantz? Well, I think the intention of the Biden administration is that Israel see that the, they, the, the administration seeks to be friends with Israel, to support Israel, to support the hostages, to stand up to Hamas, but that the Biden administration is running out of patience with Netanyahu, who they don't view as trustworthy, and whose policies in Gaza, frankly, have become uh, utterly brutal and intolerable. Uh, and so I think the Israelis see exactly what you described, which is the Biden administration granting a White House meeting to the opposition leader that it has not been willing to grant to the prime minister. Uh, as we go forward, uh, it, it, it's 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 very clear that this is the new Biden administration position: ceasefire now, ceasefire now. Uh, what happens if uh, Netanyahu continues to ignore that position? Well, if Netanyahu ignores it, or indeed if Hamas ignores it, uh, and there is no ceasefire, and we have. Ramadan beginning on March 10th, and that's kind of the deadline that everybody has had in mind. 
uh, then what you could see is a rapid deterioration in this humanitarian situation. And that could be catastrophic for the people of Gaza, but also for U.S. policy in the region, for Israel. And that's why she is now talking about, you know, opening up sea lanes, you know, providing aid via the sea, more aid via airdrops, pressuring the Israelis for more corridors via which uh, uh, truck aid can be delivered. Uh, because I think this is the thing that's really captured everybody's attention right now. Uh, we, you know, we could see a worsening of this crisis that has already been uh, intolerable so far. David Rothkopf, thank you very much for joining us tonight. My pleasure. And coming up, more from Vice President Harris. Fundamental freedoms under assault. The freedom to vote, the freedom from fear, violence, and harm, the freedom to learn, the freedom to control one's own body, and the freedom to just simply be. So, Selma, the challenges we currently face are not unlike the challenges faced by those 600 brave souls 59 years ago. And in this moment, we too then are confronted with a fundamental question. What kind of country do we want to live in? That was Vice President Harris speaking yesterday at the 59th annual commemoration of the Civil Rights March across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, that ended in a wild spree of criminal conduct by Alabama police officers illegally beating civil rights marchers and almost beating John Lewis to death. Today we know our fight for freedom is not over because in this moment we are witnessing a full-on attack on hard-fought, hard-won freedoms, starting with the freedom that unlocks all others, the freedom to vote, the sacred freedom to vote. Across our nation, extremists attack the integrity of free and fair elections, causing a rise of threats and violence against poll workers. Today in states across our nation, extremists propose and pass laws that attack the freedom of a woman to make decisions about her own body. Laws that would make no exception even for rape or incest. Here in Alabama, they attack the freedom to use IVF treatment. Women and couples denied the ability to fulfill their dream of having a child. And consider the irony. On the one hand, these extremists tell women they do not have the freedom to end an unwanted pregnancy. And on the other hand, these extremists tell women they do not have the freedom to start a family. Joining our discussion now is Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, candidate for the United States Senate in Delaware this year in 2024. Uh, Congresswoman Rochester, uh, what we just heard uh, from the vice president sounds like uh, something we're going to repeatedly be hearing de during this presidential campaign. You're a co-chair of the Biden-Harris campaign, and, and this issue of uh, in vitro fertilization seems to have helped frame uh, what Republicans are trying to do with personal freedoms that we all thought we were going to be able to enjoy. Well, first of all, Lawrence, it's good to be back with you, and especially talking about something as important as our freedoms. Uh, I have to say, uh, Vice President Harris gave a powerful speech and really drawing that analogy between uh, protecting and defending our right to vote all the way to the ability to do with our bodies as we choose. It's one of the reasons why I'm running for the Senate is to stand up and fight for these freedoms. And, you know, for me, it's also personal. Um, I have never really talked about this before, but um, my son and my daughter-in-law um, had their child through IVF. And so this is my granddaughter, Lennox. Um, Lennox was born through IVF. And there are so many families out there who, 
as she said, this is a dream. And so to have on the one hand, again, uh, extremists who are trying to s tell you when you can and cannot have a child, and then on the other hand, prevent those who want to have a child. The thing that's in common is control over women's bodies. And so as we look to this election, people really have to think about what Republicans say versus what they do. You can say that you support different things, but we saw the Dobbs decision. You can say you support IVF, but senators just voted against Senator Tammy Duckworth's bill to protect IVF. And as you look at this slippery slope, what's next? Birth control. And so to me, this is a moment for us to say, are we gonna go with folks who are taking away our freedoms or are we going to defend them? especially as John Lewis did uh, on that Edmund Pettus Bridge. Could you hold up that picture of that uh, miracle baby again, your granddaughter? Uh, because I think for people who aren't familiar with the process of IVF and how difficult it can be for some couples, some couples get lucky and go through the process once, not an easy process, no matter how often you go through it. Some couples have to go through that process several times over a number of years in order to get to that wonderful point where a grandmother like you can hold up that picture. Uh, what does it mean for families and, and couples who are in the middle of the process? They're in the middle of the process in Alabama. And the government yeah. says to them, you can't do this, not for another day. I mean, first of all, my my son and my daughter-in-law, they actually documented their process on social media to help, you know, other couples who were going through it. And as you said, actually, um, Christmas two years ago, um, I had a miscarriage and was able to try again. And Lennox was born. And so she's a rainbow baby. She just celebrated her first birthday. And to those families out there, the thought of, and the not just the families, but the, the folks who are working in the, the fertility clinics, the folks who might have to transport, uh, you know, embryos, this puts a fear on them that is not, should not be it should not be. And so, again, for those of us who have the ability to protect and codify these rights, that's what we've got to do. That's, again, why I'm running for the Senate, because this is about our fundamental freedoms, all the way from the right to vote to, to the right to choose what you will do for with your body. It's privacy. It's a medical decision. And I have said repeatedly, repeatedly, I say it all the time, there's no room in our wounds for politicians. There just isn't. Uh, the, the Senate, as you know, is trying to uh, pass a federal law that protects in vitro fertilization in all 50 states so that no couple in America ever has to worry that uh, what happened in Alabama can happen to them. And Republicans are blocking it every single time. All they need, as you know, in that Senate procedure is to have one Republican stand up and block it, and, and that blocks the vote. But that one Republican is standing up for every single Republican in the United States Senate who opposes guaranteeing to couples uh, the ability to do this. Yeah. I mean, again, I always say, don't look at what uh, somebody says. Look at what they're doing. They have this opportunity now, and I'm hearing people say, oh, I support IVF. Uh, this, is, this is different. But the, the idea that we could have a national ban on abortion, the idea that we could have uh, uh, these kind of limits and, and, and fear for families that are trying to go through IVF, and then potentially what, what happens with birth control. Again, this is one of the reasons why it's important to have representation as well in the Senate that is diverse and reflects the experiences, the lived experiences of women across this country. It's one of the reasons why I'm fighting to go to the Senate. And for anybody who's interested in joining this movement, go to LisaBluntRochester.com. We need you. 
Uh, Congressman Rochester, if you get uh, to the Senate next year, uh, I hope you can bring Lennox at, at least one day to meet Republican senators who are blocking a guarantee to all American families that they could have access to this procedure if they need it. You know, I, I plan to bring Lennox, should I make it? <laughs> And I also hope someday to be able to pass the baton on to her and to the next generation. Again, this is why this moment is so pivotal in our country, because it truly is about our fundamental freedoms. Well, you know, we've always seen those pictures of the families uh, on the day when the new senators are taking their uh, oaths of office. I think a lot of people tonight <clears throat> are going to be hoping to see Lennox uh, on that uh, Senate floor in that picture next year. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester, thank you very much for sharing your family story with this very difficult process and what's happening in Alabama. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester gets tonight's last word. The 11th hour with Stephanie Rule starts now.